to get going. Uh, we have two bills that we're going to hear in this committee today, and it's uh, my objective and my goal to complete both of these bills today. Uh, and if we have to, we will come back uh, a little later this afternoon, uh, after afternoon committees are completed, to finish our work. But it's my hope that we can finish uh, in the afternoon time slot, and that's why I want to begin uh, with our work. Uh, and so we have uh, before us Senate File 2, uh, Senator uh, Mann, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and uh, let's begin our work together. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Um, so we are here today presenting Senate File 2, which will establish the Minnesota Paid Family and Medical Leave Program. It would provide Minnesotans with a 12-week leave at partial wage replacement to take care of a new baby, bond with a new child, or take care of themselves or a family member who has suffered a major medical event. Out of almost 200 countries, the United States is one of seven that does not offer a paid leave program, and the remaining seven are largely micro-islands. Uh, the U.S. is certainly the only industrialized country without such a policy in place. In response to this, 11 other states and the District of Columbia have already implemented programs like this, and so we have the privilege of learning from them as well as from the rest of the world on what works and what doesn't. We know that when it comes to staying home with a new child, the benefits are innumerable. We see decreased maternal morbidity and mortality at a time when America's rates of maternal and morbidity, uh, morbidity and mortality are at an unacceptable high and continue to increase while the rest of the world's numbers continue to decrease. We see uh, increased rates and duration of breastfeeding, which we know result in healthier moms and healthier babies. We see increased parental mental well-being, with depression being one of the most costly diagnoses we have at this time. We see better health outcomes for children, with decreased rates of infections, such as ear infections, GI infections, pneumonia, decreased hospitalization and clinic visits. And of course, we see the increased financial stability of our families after a life-changing event, which actually leads to more people returning to the workforce instead of leaving it altogether, and also leads to a decrease in reliance on government services. We know that paid leave is a gender justice issue. When everyone is offered the same amount of leave at work, the amount of gender disparities in the workplace decrease. We know that is a workforce shortage issue. Again, people with access to leave return to the workforce at higher rates with, uh, than those that do not. It will affect our childcare and our long-term care, uh, both of which are in crisis right now. And it is a racial justice issue. Too often our BIPOC communities are left out of such benefit programs, and our bill is written in such a way that no one gets left behind. So obviously, paid medical leave is an economic issue. And so with that, Madam Chair, I would like to introduce to you Ms. Deborah Fitzpatrick, who will give a brief overview of how the program would work. Thank you, Senator Mann. Uh, I want to let everybody know that a quorum is present. Uh, Ms. Fitzpatrick, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Murphy, members of the committee. My name is Deborah Fitzpatrick, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research at Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. Uh, in my prior role at the University of Minnesota, I led a nationally recognized research team that conducted Minnesota's legislatively mandated design and implementation study under contract with DEED. I'll spend just a few minutes this, uh, this afternoon grounding the committee in the program structure at a high level and be available later for specific questions. Uh, so Senate File 2 sets up a statewide publicly administered insurance program that is self-funded and sustainable over the long term through contributions from both workers and employers, including those in the public sector. It allows self-employed people and business owners to join the program and employers to provide a comparable benefit. Uh, a comparable program. Eligibility is based on workforce participation and, in most cases, a health care provider certifies the need for the leave and also the length of the leave. Much of the program is designed to build on Minnesota's successful UI processes as well as those in other states. So among the design options, this one was chosen for a variety of reasons. I'll lift up uh, just three. First, it is a portable wage replacement benefit, especially important for workers with multiple employers and those changing jobs. 
Second, it creates the broadest possible risk pool, a feature necessary for keeping costs low and leveling the playing field among employers and workers. And finally, it is the proven, effective, sustainable model that gives all workers an opportunity to earn and count on this benefit from year to year and makes costs currently borne by both employers and workers more predictable. While the bill provides up to 12 weeks, as Senator Mann mentioned, for medical leave and up to 12 weeks for family leave, experience shows that workers take what they need, and that is on average less than the maximum allowed. For example, Massachusetts allows up to 26 weeks, and median leave lengths have been around 12. In Washington, the entitlement is 12 to 18 weeks, and the average has been less than eight. There is no evidence that Minnesota workers are less committed to their employers or coworkers or more inclined to abuse their benefits than those in other states. In fact, one could argue the opposite. Of note to this committee's jurisdiction, uh, we also include up to 12 uh, weeks for um, uh, uh, deployment of a, mili a military member's active duty service or notice of impending call or order to active duty. This is uh, basically modeled after FMLA. This has been in place through FMLA for uh, since that law passed, and uh, this would allow those folks taking needing that kind of leave to get some pay through this program. Also wanted to just kind of highlight how there are two uh, related components in the bill. The first is wage replacement, and the second is employment protected leave, and they have slightly different eligibility requirements. For wage replacement, an earnings history and an eligible event are required. For the employment protections, uh, the, the wage replacement is eligibility is the underlying situation, plus 90 days with that current employer is necessary. Employment, protection, employment protected leave entitlements under this bill, Senate File 2, run concurrently with those provided by the FMLA or Minnesota's pregnancy and parenting unpaid leave laws. Finally, luckily, Minnesota has the opportunity, as Senator Mann mentioned, to build on and learn from the experiences of several other states, some of which started their programs in the heat of COVID and others which have been around for decades. These lessons are the foundation for Senate File 2. With that, I'll end and be here for questions later. Thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick, and I'm grateful that you will stay for questions. Uh, I would like to move through the testimony. Uh, but I know that we will uh, come back to questions. Uh, I also know this bill has been to a number of committees and will continue through a number of committees, so I appreciate uh, the thorough examination. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, to the testimony table Ashley and John Kennedy from St. Paul, if they are present. Welcome to the committee. Um, I, I want to let everybody know that um, Ashley and John live in the district I represent, um, and we're grateful that you're here uh, to share your story. Uh, so please identify yourself for the record uh, and proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Ashley Kennedy, and my husband, John Kennedy, and I live with our daughters in St. Paul and Chair Murphy's district. I'm currently a state employee working for the Minnesota Judicial Branch. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today in support of Senate File 2. We are urging you to support this bill and ensure it includes comprehensive paid family leave for families of stillbirth. As parents of a daughter who died shortly before birth, we know firsthand how our communities and employers can fall short when it comes to supporting parents of child loss. There's a stigma about childbirth and infant loss even though it affects thousands of families each year. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that each year approximately 24,000 babies are stillborn in the United States. We hope that by sharing our story, we can bring attention to parents of infant loss and honor the memory of our daughter. On March 15, 2021, after 72 hours of labor, our daughter, Blair Evelyn Kennedy, died and was born. At 31 weeks gestation, she weighed three pounds, eight ounces, and was 17 inches long. 
She had beautiful dark hair and gorgeous blue eyes, almost an exact replica of her two older sisters. We only had four hours with Blair before we had to say goodbye. There are no words to describe the pain of having a stillborn baby. And while you may be thinking that you could never imagine what we went through, we ask that you take the time to imagine what it's like to experience the death of a child. Because that's what, that is when we hope you can see the importance of explicitly including stillbirth in Senate File 2. Since her death, we have found an entire community of parents whose children have died at birth or in infancy. Many of these parents lack access to resources like paid leave to recover from childbirth and grieve their children. In my case, one week after Blair's funeral and just three weeks after her death and birth, I ran out of sick time and asked to access my paid parental leave, leave that human resources told me I could access as a state employee. Even though I was expressly told that I met all eligibility requirements for paid parental leave, the judicial branch denied my leave, stating that the unwritten intent of the policy is for parents to bond with their baby. They made a determination that because Blair died, I could not bond with her and therefore did not qualify for paid parental leave. The judicial branch further stated that since bonding is a requirement, paid leave could be withdrawn if a child who was born alive were to die at any point during which the employee was receiving paid parental leave. The judicial branch has no paid leave policy to recover from childbirth. Parents of child loss are still parents. While I was dealing with the intense trauma, I was also recovering from pregnancy and childbirth, which is a major medical event. This lack of leave is unconscionable and also dangerous to the health of the birthing parent. The branch's denial of my leave added trauma by refusing to acknowledge the very real health and emotional toll of childbirth and child loss. My name is John Kennedy, and I echo Ashley's thank you for your time today. Parents whose children die should not have to return to work just days after attending their baby's funeral. Senate Bill 2 will ensure that all parents have access to paid parental leave, which benefits not just employees, but employers as well. As one of the state's largest employers, the state of Minnesota has declared one of its missions is to be a model employer. However, the treatment that Ashley and our family as a whole received clearly fell short of that goal. Ashley's experience stands in stark contrast to my own. As an employee of a private law firm, I received support following Blair's death and confirmation that the firm's expanded paid leave policy still applies in the event of childbirth, of stillbirth. The state, on the other hand, took a step in the wrong direction. We are here today to urge the legislature to make it clear that all employers should su support parents, including those who experience child loss. We support this bill and we are grateful that it currently includes parents of stillborn babies. And we encourage you to keep this provision of the bill intact to ensure that all families are supported in their times of greatest need. Ashley and I are now expecting to add our fourth child and we hope for the very best outcome. Meanwhile, we continue to honor Blair every day and advocate for support for those affected by pregnancy and infant loss. We urge you to think about family and friends who have endured child and infant loss and keep them in, their, in your mind as you continue to shape leave and policies reflective of our family values. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your testimony, Senator Mayquay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to thank um, Ashley and John for sharing your story and Blair's story with us because I know it would be really difficult, but um, what a beautiful testament to your love for her, and congratulations on your fourth child. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Unless there are burning questions from committee members, what I'd like to do is proceed with the testimony, get through the testimony, and then come back to the bill author and the, and the, uh, the questions from the committee. I am seeing nodding heads, which I appreciate. Uh, and so we will proceed to the testimony, and I would invite uh, Billy and Mike Packer, business owners, uh, up, to the, up to the witness table to testify or they're virtual. I'm so sorry. We're yeah. going to have some virtual testimony today. I just got to make sure I'm looking at my notes.
Good afternoon, and welcome to the committee. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Thank you so much for having us today and uh, allowing us to speak. Um, Mike and I are on, we are owners of the Blacktop Bar and Grill in Elgin, Minnesota. We have 23 employees, about a 6,000 square foot building in a community of 1149 for the population with maybe an additional 5,000 people um, outside of that, that that would potentially come to our bar or restaurant. We employ 16 year olds in the service industry um, to try to teach them. So we have a lot of high schoolers that work one to two days a week, uh, but we do have some full-time employees and we, uh, we, we recognize the difference there. Our payroll every month is about um, just under $20,000. We had a, a, we've only been on operation for about a year. Our payroll was very high to start. It's definitely in line now that we, people know their roles and we've been able to kind of figure out the community. We have already had to raise our prices on our, in our menu um, three times since we opened one year ago. We also, in addition to that, we also support the, the Elgin Fire Department with um, charitable gambling, all goes to the Elgin Fire Department, keeping taxes in that community low. And I think our gambling manager would say they haven't had to raise taxes in about seven years because of the equipment, the money that's um, generated goes to keep those machines up to date. So what this bill means to us is it means the math that we did was much different than what was shown on the screen. Um, we are looking at in combination with the safe and sick bill, if that also passes $19,000 a year uh, with our employees and our, and that's if we pass on half of this cost to our employees. So that's going to mean somewhere between 100 and 175 to them based on the hours that we figured out for the for the full-time employees. Um, we will not be able to provide free meals anymore because meals are um, something that is in, in this bill that is a uh, income. We don't keep track of it right now. Our employees themselves are making their own meals with the food that we're providing for them. And some of them, this is the only meal that they're getting at a restaurant. Some of them don't drive. They live in that community. They don't leave in that community and we're the only restaurant. Uh, we, we won't be implementing a vacation or a bonus option for our full-time employees if this is implemented. It's one of the best attractants that we've had. Mike did this for 10 plus years at his, at his prior uh, business, Premier Auto Glass, and we took employees on vacation with us. They had an option. They could either take a bonus or they could go on vacation, and they always picked vacation. Uh, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a great benefit. Our vendors are also like, shot distributing, Reinhardt, those people are also gonna be implementing this program. So they're gonna pass on to the consumer those prices, which is us, prices are gonna go up there. Um, we may have to look at not employing as many people. Right now we're fully staffed if you walk into our restaurant and that's by design because we want people to have a good experience. We want them to be greeted immediately. And again, like I said, we're, we're teaching 16, 17 year olds who can't serve alcohol. So we have to have a bartender run the drinks for them and card people, but they can certainly serve and bring food and adios dishes. And so, and that's part of our design um, at Blacktop. So if this gets implemented, um, I guess I just want you guys to think about the small communities. Um, I also work for a great organization who provides a benefit, um, a leave and, you know, shame on our state for not recognizing that Ashley needed that time um, that's where sometimes legislation gets in the way of itself, I think. But, but please think about communities like Mazeppa, Zumbra Falls, Elgin, Millville, Plainview, Iota, Tileman, Belchester, Hammond, Goodhue, all of which are within a half an hour of our restaurant, um, all of which have small bar owners who have not, we have probably the largest team of um, people, but really when I look at this, it feels like it's going to be killing those small towns because if those restaurant and bars and places for people to get together who have already been hit hard financially um, are going to be hit again, it's, um, and Mike, I know, go ahead and say what you wanted to say. I know we only have two minutes, so thanks for listening. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I'm wondering if you could please for me uh, identify yourself for the record. 
Oh, I'm so sorry. That's okay. So my name is my name is Billy Packer. It's Bonnie Billington Packer. I go by Billy. Thank you, um, Billy Packer. I appreciate that. And I do uh, want to urge you to uh, in, you know, conclude your remarks. We are going to hold people to two minutes just so we make sure that we get through everybody's testimony. And, I, and, and I'm glad that you're here, here Billy Packer, um, but I also want to say that the, the interest of small business is not in the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, I understand this bill is going to Commerce next, uh, where that will be part of the discussion. Um, so I'm glad you're here, glad that you're sharing, um, but not uh, the subject matter that we examine in this committee. So I just want to be really clear about that. So um, I thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Mike Packer, is there anything that you want to add? Because um, we have gone over the two minutes of time. You're muted. Welcome to the committee, Mike Packer. Um, and we can't hear you. Unmute, let's see that. How's that? Can you hear me now? Thank you. What? Welcome to the committee, Mike Packer. All right, thank you very much. Again, my name is Mike Packer, Blacktop Bar and Grill. I'll make this really quick. It seems to me with this, it seems to me that the legislation is dictating pay and policy. They're doing a lot of things that the unions do. Um, they're dictating pay policy, imposing rules and penalties on the employers only, and doing this um, without a vote from the, from the employees. I mean, I've talked to our employees about these things that we're they're running through the legislature right now, and they do not want them. Because we have 23 employees, three of those are, are full-time. All these part-timers, um, this is just a high school income. This is a supplemental income. This is uh, just their fun money. That's that's how we're operating. So I, I implore you guys to take that kind of thing into consideration. Um, maybe make some kind of provisions for, for, and I'm sure there probably is that kind of stuff written in there. I'm, I'm not going to take a lot of time, but I want to share one quick story. It happened this morning. One of my cooks walked into my office in complete tears. Her best friend died of a heart attack this morning. While we'll have... You know, we have the compassion and the ability to give her time off, take care of that as much time as she needs. If this kind of uh, policy goes into effect and Tammy has 18 hours of, of off time built up, um, it's going to tie our hands into giving our employees what we want to give them. And it's going to be mandated what, uh, what the state says we have to do. And that, that just really sounds kind of cold to me. Um, I hope you consider the smaller employees, the smaller businesses when doing this. I'll, I know we're over time, so I'll let you go. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Uh, up next is Matt Hilgert, uh, coming from the Association of Minnesota Counties, and follow that, following that will be Lee Sullivan. So, Lee, if you can be ready as well. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed, and we are timing this for two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Matt Hilgert. I represent the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. I'm also speaking today on behalf of Alex Hassel, who works for the League of Minnesota Cities. She's called to testify on another committee. So I'm combining the testimony on behalf of all cities and counties in the state of Minnesota. Together, counties and cities employ tens of thousands of Minnesota employees across the state. And I want to say proudly because our workforce is our number one asset, and we realize that, and we are proud of the work that county employees, city employees do on every day on behalf of Minnesotas, Minnesotans across the state. The issue of paid family leave within our membership is complex, and there are various viewpoints on this legislation. Our members are very sympathetic to the workforce shortages that Senator Mann already talked about, and I don't think it's fair to talk about workforce shortages without talking about things like child care and paid family leave. Um, I just want to know, uh, let the committee know that counties and cities collectively bargain um, with many various collectively bargaining agencies across the state and provide uh, a plethora of robust benefits, but they are diverse benefits. Those CBA agreements are reflective of the unique needs of each membership group that we collectively bargain with. So for example, in Blue Earth County, the average county employee has over 500 hours of PTO stored out, 
stored up in addition to short-term disability and additional FMLA coverage. In Hennepin County, there is a 12-week uh, paternity leave. Um, in Wright County, they just collectively bargain for their own 12-week uh, paternity leave. Uh, it is not uncommon to have sick leave banks in excess of 1,000 hours with short-term disability plans in addition to FMLA. So I just wanted to paint a picture that these are significant um, benefit programs. And the three things that we are very grateful that Senator Mann has at least um, met with us on various times um, and, and, and heard us out on our concerns is we have three specific requests. Uh, the first two are kind of more logistical requests. One is to make clear that the employer premium share is truly divided 50-50. I think there's shared uh, intent that that is the case, but we have some comfort language that I think would make that a little clearer. The second is that deed, the commissioner would be giving our premium notice of any kind of increase in that premium before we set our preliminary levies. Because if we're given that notice, it rises from 0.7% to 1%. After September 30th, we won't have the flexibility to accommodate that in our levy changes. And the third is getting to more of a complex policy conversation around how can we recognize, uh, provide a little bit more flexibility in this legislation to recognize programs like in St. Louis County, 1,600 hours of paid sick leave, 100% salary placement and the ability to be paid out uh, if you keep those upon retirement. Um, and so we look forward to continued conversations and I do appreciate the time that the author has given us thus far. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hilgert. And if you have testimony in writing that you can share with me in the committee, I'd be grateful. Thank you. Next up, uh, Lee Sullivan. And I understand that you are gonna be testifying on this bill and your testimony applies to Sandy, Senator Sandy Pappas's bill. Yeah, I believe that's the case. Please welcome to the committee, identify yourself, and you've got two minutes, thank you. Okay, sounds great. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. My name is Lee Sullivan, and I am a revenue tax specialist at the Minnesota Department of Revenue. I'm testifying today as a proud member of MAPE in support of Senate File 2, pay, paid family medical leave and Senate File 34 earn sick and save time. In 2016 and 17, our union campaigned for a paid parental leave policy, or PPL, to allow new parents crucial bonding time after the birth or adoption of a child. I heard many stories of parents who faced struggles after giving birth, and I felt really passionate about helping to bring PPL to my workplace to give security and peace of mind to new parents and their babies. During the campaign, I became pregnant and faced my own struggles. I had difficulty giving birth and I actually spent five days in the hospital, three of which were spent in labor before actually having a, a C-section. My husband was the only, um, he, my husband was only allowed to use five sick days for the birth and all of them were spent with me at the hospital. When we returned home, my husband had to go back to work while I stayed home with my son. This was extremely difficult as I was still healing from the C-section, and I also suffered from chronic fatigue and help pro hip problems. HR would not allow my husband to use FMLA to care for me because post-pregnancy recovery, no matter how difficult, is not a qualifying medical event. I also needed to keep a close eye on my own sick leave as I was the caretaker for my elderly mother who faced many, many health issues. Since I used up the FMLA for the year for the birth of my son, I was not allowed to do it again later that year. Uh, again, I faced another challenge when my son was uh, diagnosed with autism and he needed numerous speech and th physical therapy appointments. Despite all this, I was fortunate enough to be able to access the PPL benefit and have sick leave from the state, which many Minnesotans who are in lower incomes and service industries do not have. You will later hear a bill that greatly expands access to earned sick and safe time for other industries, and I highly encourage you to support it. The PPL benefit we fought for has a lot of areas where we can improve, however. We are required to spend down our sick leave accruals before we can access the benefit, leaving little to no safety net for when we get sick or actually need medical uh, need to attend medical appointments. Ms. Sullivan, I'll ask you to wrap up, please. I'm sorry, what? I'll ask you to wrap up, please. Okay, sure. Um, it does not cover medical leave and it runs concurrent with FMLA, so if our parents, if our families need extended care like mine, uh, we hope that this is in the same calendar year as when we use PPL. 
Uh, these bills, they won't fix everything, but we, we hope we can, you know, we can take honest strides in making Minnesota a state and an employer that values our well-being, security, and make it accessible to our employees, not, uh, not just our employees, but all Minnesotans. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. I appreciate it. Uh, next, we will hear from Jessica Peterson-White, and she will be virtual from Northfield. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for hearing from me today, uh, Chair Murphy and the committee. I'm Jessica Peterson-White. I own Content Bookstore in downtown Northfield, and I also serve on the Northfield City Council. Um, I'm here today to ask you to support the proposed paid family medical leave insurance program and want to be clear that the views I'm expressing here are my own. Um, in 2018, the city of Northfield passed a six-week paid leave policy for city employees. Before that, we only offered optional short-term disability insurance, which is what many cities do. Um, some people will tout these programs as a good alternative to paid leave, but they're really a poor substitute. Users must elect to pay for the coverage long before they're even pregnant. And payouts are usually around 60% of regular wages for six weeks. Um, and of course, this kind of short-term disability insurance doesn't cover a huge range of situations, many of which you've heard about already today. Um, I'm proud of the leave we've been able to offer to City of Northfield employees, but I also know that it's not enough. I doubt any parent believes that six weeks is sufficient time at home with a newborn or in any number of other situations. But we have had to place a limit on what we can offer as a city because we have to keep our budget consistent and predictable and longer leaves could mean widely varying costs for a smaller employer like the City of Northfield. A bigger pool in the form of a statewide insurance program would make us stronger and more resilient. It's just a, it's a more logical solution. Um, Opponents of paid leave would also have you believe that a statewide insurance program represents a new and additional cost for employers. Um, but I think that, that the current costs are actually just hidden. They're already being borne every day by um, families who have to choose between caregiving and paid work and by employers who have to scrape together the resources to do what their employers need on the fly as the need arises and are often unable to provide what is truly needed. Um, meanwhile, many white collar employees of larger Minnesota companies enjoy great paid family leave programs already and statewide paid leave insurance would allow smaller organizations like the city of Northfield to compete by offering comparable benefits. Nearly every employee of every organization in the state, including local government, has a family counting on them to be both caregivers and breadwinners. Nobody should have to choose between their job and the well-being of their child. And we need a system that keeps family income steady during those precious early months during medical crises and that gives employers a better way to offer what their employees want and expect. You have the power to help create that and I hope you will. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, uh, Ms. Uh, Peterson-White. It's good to see you. And next I'd like to welcome to the committee Ashley Grimm. Uh, Ashley is a St. Louis County Commissioner. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself and proceed. You have two minutes. Hi everyone, thanks for having me here. So I'm Ashley Grimm, I am a St. Louis County Commissioner and I'm here today because paid family medical leave is a huge opportunity to support our workers, to address the workforce challenges that we're seeing statewide and to work upstream with families before they need county supports. So as a county commissioner, I've seen that losing employees is hard on budgets, it's hard on our services, it's hard on morale. And because of this, I've been part of retention efforts at the county and have seen one thing consistently. To attract and retain employees, we need to give them the pay, benefits, and dignity they deserve. I really see it as good economics, and it's also the right thing to do. So you've likely heard a lot of stories that are horrific about what people have had to endure without paid family medical leave. Uh, losing last moments with loved ones, first moments with children, recovery time. This is not just the cost of business. Loss of dignity can't be the price we pay for getting work done. Not at the county, not anywhere. And paid family medical leave creates a sustainable way for all workers to have the benefits they deserve by pooling risk and making everyone part of the solution. And lastly, I also want to touch on that this would help the people counties work with. I've seen what it looks like when someone loses their job because of taking care of a sick child or a medical emergency, then that cascades into losing their housing, then losing custody of their child. And your counties are the ones who then work with these families to stabilize. 
They put them on housing wait lists that can last up to two years. And we constantly are working downstream when we need upstream solutions. So I'm excited that this is on the table. I urge you to pass it uh, to work with counties and small businesses to give the financial need uh, support that they need and alleviate potential yeah. property yeah. tax burdens. Uh, and I urge you to work on these upstream yeah. solutions yeah. because we have so much potential right now to make a real difference in people's lives. So thank you so much for your time and for letting me speak. Thank you, Commissioner Grimm. We appreciate your testimony. Next, uh, we have Kylie Sari, I believe, uh, virtually from Fairmont. Uh, she is a public health nurse. My name is Kylie Sari. I'm a public health nurse and international board certified lactation consultant with Fairbone and Martin Counties. Um, I'm speaking today as a board member of the Minnesota Breastfeeding Coalition. Often in my work as a maternal child health nurse, I take on the role of a compassionate listener when new parents realize they will have to go back to work sooner than they expected, often in just four weeks, many in two weeks, and some as soon as just days after hospital discharge. I've talked to moms who don't want to even start a nursing relationship, depriving the child of immune boosting colostrum because they have to go back to work so soon. I've counseled moms who've tried to breastfeed, but without being able to establish their supply before returning to work, struggled to pump, ultimately feeling like failures. I've listened to moms as they told me through their tears of their isolation and depression, sitting at home while their partner goes back to work days after discharge, and even heard moms say they don't want to bond with their baby because it would hurt too much if they did. Without protections, many birthing people don't get the chance to heal after childbirth, establish breastfeeding and, and milk supply, or get to know their new family member before going back to work. All of this affects the broader community and takes a toll on employers, community groups, and social services. I urge you to pass the Paid Family and Medical Leave Act for the sake of families, for the sake of children, and for the sake of our communities. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ms. Sari. Next, uh, we will hear from Hannah Jarabek, also virtually from McLeod County. Welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and proceed. Hello, thank you for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Hannah Jarabek, and I'm a licensed social worker with McLeod County Health and Human Services and a member of the Minnesota Nurses Association. I started with McLeod County in May of 2014. Unbeknown to me, I was pregnant when I started the job, which I found out just four days after I started. It was an exciting time, but also full of stress and complications. I scheduled my prenatal appointments and followed through with all of my appointments and ultrasounds. I was very sick throughout my entire pregnancy, and at 30 weeks pregnant, I was diagnosed with preeclampsia and started having almost daily appointments for various reasons to keep watch on myself and baby. My daughter was born at 34 weeks and five days via emergency C-section. Because my daughter was early, she spent the first six days of her life in the neonatal intensive care unit. They were concerned with my blood's ability to clot, so I stayed for five days with extra ultrasounds and a blood transfusion. We both came home five days before Christmas and noticed something wasn't right with my incision. It was infected and had to be debrided to remove the dead tissue and packed multiple times a day in multiple places for six weeks. My pregnancy and start to motherhood weren't what I imagined, to say the least. Then imagine filling out all of the short-term disability paperwork and being denied because my pregnancy was considered a pre-existing condition. Due to conditions around my employment start, I also wasn't able to utilize FMLA, resulting in my husband and I having to pay privately for a portion of our health insurance. I should have been able to focus on healing and bonding with my new daughter. Instead, this was a definite burden to my new little family and our financial situation. Since I had only been working at the county for six months or so, I didn't have much vacation and sick time, so I had to use most of it and take most of my maternity leave unpaid. That also left me coming back to work with very little vacation and sick time, which was a challenge having a preemie who needed a lot of follow-up appointments. Again, I should have been able to focus on the health and well-being of myself and my child instead of having, I had to navigate the difficult barriers to stay employed and bring home the income my family needed. Though I do not plan to have more children, I am fighting for paid family medical leave for all of my coworkers in our contract bargaining. 
I cannot stand by and let anyone else go through all the stress and pain my family experienced without speaking up. Yet I just watched my fellow MNA members fight for paid family medical leave in the Metro and Duluth contract campaigns without success. This is why we need to pass the Senate File 2, the Paid Family Medical Leave Act, to ensure all Minnesotans have access to this life-changing benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Jerbeck. I appreciate your testimony. Up next, uh, we have uh, Georgia Fort, uh, business owner. And again, small business, business is not the jurisdiction necessarily of this committee, but we welcome you. And following that, we'll have Commissioner Grove from the Department of Economic Development. Uh, and then we'll move to questions. Thank Welcome you, to the committee. Chair. Please identify yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members for your time today. My name is Georgia Ford. I am a wife, a mother, and I own a media company where I work as a journalist. However, the path to becoming an independent journalist was not linear. In 2017, I was a news anchor at a TV station in Duluth, Minnesota. At nine months pregnant, I was legally terminated because I was not eligible for maternity leave under FMLA. Then, when I was pregnant with my youngest, I worked for Ramsey County. My position was classified as temporary, so although very different circumstances, I again did not qualify for time off. They did provide a two-week unpaid leave, but no daycares will actually take a child that's two weeks old. So luckily, my family stood in the gap. Now, while I was able to overcome the financial hardship of unpaid leave, here we are four years later, I'm still recovering physically from going back to work too soon. I went back to work on a Monday, and by Friday, I was rehospitalized for hemorrhaging, the leading cause of death from childbirth. If this can happen to a news anchor, if this can happen to a government employee, it can happen to anyone. United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article 16, says it's a human right to have a family. And for that reason, parental leave is mandated in most countries. So why not America? Why not Minnesota? I share my experiences today not to tear down any employers who are simply enforcing the law, but I share my experiences today in hopes that it will fuel more equitable laws for my daughters, for your daughters, and for generations to come. In closing, I urge you today to vote for this bill so that business owners like myself can have support to be able to create employment experiences that are more compassionate than the ones that I had. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Commissioner Grove. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Steve Grove and I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development. And wow, what a, what a great list of testifiers. Uh, it just makes me emotional as a dad sitting back there and hearing the stories of, of so many here who are arguing so eloquently for why this policy is uh, long overdue for our state. And I come today to talk about how we as a department are looking at this and then get into some of the details as we navigate how this might look. Uh, so I'm coming to you both as a commissioner but also as a dad of two six-year-old twins um, and six years ago when they were born. I had the opportunity to take a paid leave uh, from the business that I was working for and it was a experience that I can't imagine not having. Uh, we were two on two, uh, young parents with little ones around, and having that time off was essential both for our family and for their health. Um, this program, as has been stated by uh, its author here, uh, Senator Mann and Deb Fitzpatrick, uh, her partner in this effort uh, in, the, in the development of this bill, is not the first state that would have ever done this. We'd be the 13th. Eight states have done it so far. Four on the way. We've been looking at a lot of these programs and how they work and talking to the officials from other states and seeing how did this come together? What are they learning? What can we learn from their experience so far? And one of the things that is really clear when you look into the data on these programs is just how good they are for women and for families. When you look at um, what women who have paid leave after the birth of their child experience in the workplace after having had that leave, 82% of them are likely to be working 10 years later, compared to about 60% of those who are working 10 years later if they did not have paid leave. So this is a way to retain workforce longer term. And of course, for young kids, those first 1,000 days of brain development are essential, and being near your parents is the number one factor that will contribute to having the brain development you need to become um, a functioning and happy member of society, and eventually a future worker for our economy. This is also, as been stated here, an equity issue. We know that. Um, the lack of paid family leave policies 
in our state disproportionately hurt those from communities of color and those in greater Minnesota and those who work for smaller businesses. It's those professional and managerial companies who offer these plans because they know they need to to attract talent. It's the small businesses that often do not. 75% um, of Minnesota's workforce is left out of paid leave today. Um, and it's typically those working class professions that are, that are left out from the policy. Lastly, we think this is good for workforce and business. We talk a lot about competitiveness these days with uh, so much moving in our economy and the need to differentiate ourselves compared to other states. It has never been a more competitive time for labor, for business, to attract folks to want to come and live and work here. And boy, could we differentiate ourselves as a talent market if we pass a PFML plan that works well. And when you talk to those businesses in states where they have passed a plan, you will hear great reviews. In California, a survey of businesses found sky-high reviews for their PFML plan. 89% uh, said they had a huge impact on productivity, 91% on profitability, 96% said it has a positive impact on turnover, and almost all those surveyed said it has a huge impact on morale. So this is a policy uh, that works for workers, uh, it works for business, and it works for families most importantly, and we are excited to move forward with it. And I think, you know, specific to this committee's focus, I'll offer a couple of um, components just on kind of program construction as we look at what it will take to stand this up and then uh, defer to, to the author and, and others for, for questions and, and conversation. Um, the first thing you'd have to do to build a pay family medical leave plan is build out the IT infrastructure, the, the sort of platform that will be needed to both take that tax collection in from employers and pay those benefit out, benefits out. Um, we've looked at uh, our UI system. We've looked at our disability determination system. We've looked at off-the-shelf tools from... Uh, from uh, um, uh, from other states who have these programs. We estimate the bill to be around $80 million. That's an estimate. I should note the fiscal note on this bill is still coming, so it'll be a few weeks out yet, but these are our current estimates to give you a sense. Um, agency staffing for this, we think, is um, around you know, five to seven to manage a contracting uh, team, and then, of course, a contracting team would hire whoever they needed to, to complete the build. In terms of timeline, um, we estimate around three years. This is based off of looking at other states and how long it's taken them to stand up a similar program. Uh, and we, would of course, need to contract the vendor first and go through that RFI process. Uniquely here, this bill contemplates both launching the tax collection and starting to pay the benefits at the same time, um, which is unique, and given our surplus, something we'd be able to do, uh, and so that would be a unique component of how we would build this. So more to come on, on the cost as we work uh, as, a, as a group on this and hear your feedback, but those are some early estimates to give you a sense for this, and with that, back to you, Madam Chair, and thanks for having me. Thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, and that does conclude uh, the testimony of the people who have indicated their interest. Uh, and so I am going to invite Ms. Fitzpatrick uh, back to join us again. And Commissioner Grove, you should probably stick close by. Sure. Um, there will be, I am assuming, uh, some questions for the bill author and for your testifiers. Uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for bringing this bill forward. It is a bill about how we care for each other, how we each care for our families and for ourselves. Uh, and it is an important provision. Uh, and I wanna make sure that we give it its due today. Uh, so we're gonna ask some questions. I see Senator Pappas in the audience. Uh, and I just wanna remind everybody that if we're not able to get through this bill and Senator Pappas's bill, we will come back to this room at 5.30 tonight to complete our work. Um, and so we will move deliberately um, so we can get through the work. Um, and with that, uh, members, do you have questions? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Senator Mann, for the, the bill. Um, I've been reading parts of the bill. I haven't read the entire bill, but um, I'm curious if the author could tell us um, what, uh, so, I'm just reading the section under safety leave. So, what uh, what type of what type of receipts or whatever uh, proof of uh, uh, costs do, you know are are brought back uh, to show that uh, these services have been provided? Um, and what and what type of are there any qualifiers around what psychological or other counseling means? I mean. Other counseling, counseling is a very broad subject, a very broad topic. So I'm curious if you could, if you could uh, weigh in on that. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator. 
So um, this could be a doctor's note, certainly. It could be a note from the counselor. It could be a note from a victim's advocate. Um, any of those things generally would suffice. Um, the counseling piece, I think that, again, uh, so, so to have this to be qualifying, it has to be a seven-day event. Um, and generally when that happens, there will be some kind of healthcare provider involved who can then write uh, documentation needed by deed to, to have that leave uh, documented and the benefits received. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mann. Um, I will dig into that some more, but can you, I was reading uh, the definitions at 12.23 in the bill. Um, again, so, so does this pay for people that, for women to have an abortion? Senator Mann. For their time uh, getting an abortion, I guess would be the question, Madam Chair. Thank Senator you. Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. So again, for a medical leave, it has to be a seven-day qualifying event. Um, and every, uh, <coughs> if you want to talk specifically about abortion, every abortion is different, right? You could have a um, induced abortion for a fetal anomaly at 27 weeks that goes wrong, and so you have a C-section. Um, you could have a spontaneous abortion at five weeks, and you're okay two days later. Um, so every, every instance is very different and very personal, and again, that's why uh, you would need a doctor's note and a seven-day qualifying event. Senator Cheskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Senator Mann, so I mean, if, if a woman gets an abortion and needs six days to recover, that's seven days, right? Does that qualify, that time off qualify under the bill? Senator Mann. If, Madam if that's, Chair. If, that's, if she says she needs the time to, re to, to recover. Senator Mann. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. So anyone can say whatever they want. They can say, I need X amount of days to recover from anything. But again, you do need proper medical documentation that you need recovery from a medical event that has taken you out of the workforce for seven days. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Senator Mann. Thank you, Senator Jaskowski. Are there other questions? Senator Lang. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, Senator Jaskowski and Senator, uh, Madam Chair, that just spurred a, a question in my mind. What is the, the burden of proof, I guess, as far as when you said anybody can say anything they want, but when you apply for this through your employer, through the state, what is the burden of proof? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, so generally it's medical documentation from a health care provider. Senator Lang. Okay, Madam Chair, the, 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 the question, what do you mean generally? <laughs> Senator Mann. That, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a broad, broad brush you just stroked, so I was curious as to. Ch Chair Murphy, Senator Ms. Lang, Fitzpatrick. I think the generally was referring to the t couple types of leave that don't involve a serious medical condition. So we had the exigency leave that we talked about in the opening comments. That wouldn't necessarily require a medical certification. Bonding leaves don't require a medical certification, just proof of a, a birth or a, a placement of a child. Uh, the safety leave, again, there was a variety of different types of certification that could occur in that space. So I think that was the generally, was the point of generally. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Fitzpatrick. I have Senator McQuaid and then Senator Coran. Senator McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and, and um, Senator Mann. This is the first committee that I've been in. I know you've been through a lot of committees. This is the first committee I've been in that we've heard this. Um, how many countries in the world offer paid parental leave? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, Senator, all of them except for seven. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do you, could you just list those, are we one of the seven? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, yes. Senator McQuaid. Madam Chair, uh, Senator Mann, can you list those other ones that we stand in company with? Senator Mann. I don't have the list in front of me, Madam Chair, Senator, uh, but again, they are largely uh, micro islands, um, and there are no industrialized countries on that list. Thank you. Senator Mann, when you have that list, would you get it to my office, and I'll make sure and distribute it to the committee. Madam Chair, absolutely. Thank you, Senator Mann. Senator McQuaid? Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, along Senator 
Lang's questions is if questions for the the medical facilities, right? For medical leave, those they they appear to be pretty clear. Um, I don't know if you guys have tracked the medical accessibility to medical today, but it's pretty limited. So, um, walking through those pr procedures to get um, qualifying documentation, what does that look like? One that one you'd have to get an appointment; they're not readily available. Um, and then, what does that look like from a? Is that just a, a, a doctor slip? Um, what we'd look in traditional written form? Is it going to follow the prescription type uh, vehicle? Is there going to be some type of technology required to integrate, to identify, and to provide a chain of custody and to be able to validate kind of source documents for those types of leave? Ms. Fitzpatrick? Hi, Chair Murphy, uh, Senator Coran. Uh, I think, you know, there will be procedures developed in states, they usually have multiple ways for uh, those sorts of medical certifications to occur. They usually do have some kind of online uh, where doctors can, uh, healthcare providers can have an account uh, where they go into that system and certify. There are also written uh, options for those, uh, you know, situations where they may prefer that. Um, I think, again, uh, states have, there will be prescribed forms and forms of certification that will come through uh, the rulemaking process with a deed and be uh, in other states, there's been significant training done with the medical profession, with health care providers to help them understand their responsibilities under the law and the, and the different methods for doing that certification. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. So with that, in the, in the written form, and, and I guess the kind of the commission, or the part of it's to Commissioner Grove, those interfaces, I assume, are then in that $80 million cost estimate that they'll provide for those that would require some electronic source verification capabilities. But in the form of a written paper document, how will the agency, how will, how will I guess, Senator Mann, how will, how will the agencies um, validate a paper source document to validate the a claim? Senator Mann. The authenticity, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, the authenticity. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, well, I think first of all, the people have to be licensed. Um, the, the healthcare providers need to be uh, licensed, and I believe uh, again there are there are ways that uh, state agencies, and again as we've as we have mentioned, that we have this opportunity to build on all of these other states and the infrastructure that they've put in place uh, to learn from their their uh, best practices in terms of verifying these uh, the validity of these certifications. Madam Chair, Senator and, Coran. and uh, I guess Senator Mann and, and uh, the testifier. Um, great thought has been given to this because it's been on the agenda for a long time. Uh, I would assume those activities have already been done and give us some idea. I would, I'd assume we wouldn't move into some type of paper form because there really is no way to verify that. And so uh, we're looking at turning over to a state agency for private businesses, which will lose a lot of control in this process to be able to validate the very activity that's going to um, greatly impact their workforce and their ability to manage their workforce. And so those are, those are fairly straightforward, and those are the things that we're going to really look forward to in how this moves forward on the operational side. And, and I guess with that, if Commissioner Grove is going to come up, I just have a simple question for him as well. Commissioner Grove? Welcome back. Please identify yourself. Madam Chair, uh, members, Steve Grove, Commissioner of the Department of Employment and Economic Development. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Grove. You've, you've given this great thought. So in your IT um, assessment today, um, you mentioned a couple options about how you may go about procuring at the high level. Is this since there are a variety of other states and many other countries we hear that do this, um, what are your intentions on the, on the IT side of it, buy, build, or lease? Madam Chair, Senator, uh, Senator, Senator Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator Coran, so um, on the IT build more broadly, we would put out an RFP and find a great partner. There are those who built systems in other states uh, and in some cases, they built them on top of existing programs that simply needed to be advanced further to accommodate PFML. Uh, in some states, they built them from the ground up. 
And we would be in the second category. I think notably, we have a great unemployment insurance technology infrastructure at our state, one of the best in the country. Uh, we could learn from that, but we couldn't use it because it is a different program. And so we'd have to procure this differently, which is why you can't just kind of uh, cut and paste your uh, UI system into a new PFML system. Um, so we get in conversations with, with, with vendors and talk that through and, and build a program that works. And to your earlier question on paper documents, I think the testifier and the senator are absolutely right. Um, and I would also add that, you know, we don't anticipate you having a lot of paper documentation. So much of this happens digitally today. We would really build systems that made that as easy as possible and, 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 and preference those. Um, and I think as it relates to disputes or ensuring that we have accuracy, I, I think some of that would be borne out in the rulemaking that's contemplated in the legislation um, to make sure that we land this right and that we're fair and that we're paying the right amount of money to the right people. Madam Chair. Senator Coran. Uh, so on the IT side, you describe uh, a couple options, um, a procurement cycle, which we're not, we wouldn't be ready until we make a determination of the vehicle or path, unless you're going to, the initial RFP is going to be for procurement assistance or determination. Um, but you just described likely a homegrown build it here is what I'm getting out of your answer. So is that, is that what we intend to do? Commissioner Grove. Uh, Madam Chair uh, and Senator, I think you know, we're going to work closely with Minute and all the procurement options. And I think uh, we want to do that in line with the guidance that uh, they would offer us. And the good news is I think we have other states to reference and look at this to ensure we get it right. I know you as a member of the Blue Urban Technology Committee know how much of an advancement we've made as a state in IT. Um, and so we're confident we can land it. And we want to be really thoughtful about it. And we want to build not just the same system other states have, but a better one. Madam Chair, for last comment on this particular topic. Um, Commissioner Grove, the great, is a long way around saying, yeah, we plan to build it in-house. And I would agree, we don't have a technology problem in this state. We have a problem with um, expert knowledge of rules definition and complex decision making. This is one of them. And so to go off on our own, when we, we claim that there's many other states already have this at great working models, there must be a vendor that has a, it deployed in at least a couple different states that we would bring in to be able to build this in a much more efficient manner. So that's, that. I, I look forward to working with you on that as we uh, explore that path. Commissioner Grove, one more comment? Yeah, Madam Chair, Senator, I appreciate that. And your expertise will be great in helping us land this right. Um, I will say that we're going to look to go off the shelf as much as possible. We don't need to build this from the ground up here. Um, there are things to learn from in other states. Uh, there are things that are unique on, contemplated in this bill that will differentiate our IT system from others. So uh, there will be some staffing within minute indeed to make sure we get that right. Um, but I think we want to build this off the shelf as much as we can. So. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, before I go to Senator Morrison, um, Senator Mitchell, um, welcome to the committee virtually. And uh, per our rules, it would be helpful for us if you could identify yourself and, and let us know where you're zooming in from. Um, hi, this is Senator Mitchell. I am zooming in from Woodbury, um, <laughs> where I'm kind of taking advantage of things being discussed here today with a, a sick child. So I'm um, very empathetic to this. I'm also someone who is in the state of New York when I lost a pregnancy to a stillbirth and was subsequently temporarily disabled. So I, I greatly think that these are things that we need to have available for our population. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Senator Mann, for bringing this bill forward. Um, I do want to just note that um, we fill out family leave uh, forms all the time in obstetric offices because we deliver a lot of babies and people need time to recover from that experience and to bond with their uh, new child. It's a pretty straightforward form. Um, you know, we're proud here in Minnesota to have many Fortune 500 companies and a lot of employees of those companies, particularly their executives, have very generous paid family leave um, benefits. Um, a lot of what we're talking about uh, centers around people who don't work for companies like that, um, who are just as deserving. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, I hope that pe people are, are able to take unpaid family leave after giving birth. Um, because I hope that we can all agree that people shouldn't be fired for getting pregnant and certainly not for having a baby. Um, but I do just want to recenter us to um, all of the testifiers, but particularly Ms. Fort, thank you very much for coming here today and sharing your story. 
It resonates with me as an obstetrician, having watched helplessly as patients have had to return to work because they can't afford to not work way too soon after a vaginal delivery and after a C-section, and occasionally running into the same complications that Ms. Fort ran into. If we want to support children and families, this is a step that Minnesota has to take. So no question, but just a comment and gratitude to you for taking this on. Thank you, Senator Morrison. Are there other questions? Are there amendments? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got both. Um, what, um, Rep uh, Senator Mann, uh, what, what, what does the bill do if people commit fraud? Uh, we know this government is plumb full of fraud. Uh, this is another huge government program. What are you going to do in the bill in order to make certain that uh, the same fraud we're seeing in many of our other programs is not going to occur here? Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator. So we definitely have teeth in the bill to deal with that first, and I'll, um, Ms. Fitzpatrick will go through that. But I also want to say that with this particular program, we do not see fraud in other states, right? People generally, I'm going to take that generally back. I say that a lot, and I don't particularly mean in the way people think I mean it. People do not stay home for partial wage replacement for fun, right? Um, people cannot afford to do that. Uh, the other thing, again, is that there are stringent requirements that qualify you to take this leave. You're not going to make up a baby. Um, you're not going to get a false doctor's note. And so we're not seeing that as an issue with this particular leave in other states, which is fantastic. And there's zero reason to think why that would happen in Minnesota either. Uh, but as far as the specifics, Ms. Fitzpatrick. It's Chair Murphy, Senator Drogowski. Um, I, you know, again, we're building on some of the experience in the UI program as well in terms of building out a variety of checks and balances as we are in other states, again, in terms of those verifications. Um, people have to have wage credits in the system. So again, this is an earned benefit. I think that's a really important element to bring forward. Um, so we are, uh, you know, Again, creating this opportunity for people to pay in, contribute to um, having this available to them when these events occur. So again, I think there's a variety of things to learn from and are reflected in the bill, uh, learnings from the uh, fraud prevention efforts within the UI system, as well as, you know, as we build out and do the rulemaking and so on, building on those experiences in other states. And as Senator Mann said, there's been no evidence of uh, significant or any fraud really in these other states that have these programs. So I think we can rest assured that the, the mechanisms that we would be building on there are sufficient. Senator, Des Senator Deskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, thank Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, our state government's uh, track record is not as, as flowery as you make it. Um, I, don't, I don't see the teeth in the bill, but Madam Chair, Senator Mann, Ms. Fitzpatrick, um, and I'm trying to understand this family leave segment of the bill, but if Uncle Charlie's in Florida, or, or I say Uncle Charlie's in Florida, and I need to, you know, he's, he's dying, right? Um, and so I go spend a week down there. Uh, what do I need to bring, bring back to show truly that Uncle Charlie was dying? Senator Mann. Madam Chair. So to your first question, it's, it's section 26 talks about overpayments and how those that would be collected back with, with penalties and fees. Um, to your second question, um, you need proper docu doctor physician uh, documentation of the medical condition that resulted in at least seven days of not being able to work for your family member. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senator Mann. Um, I've got an amendment, Madam Chair. I, I'm, I'm still struggling with uh, the propensity for fraud in this bill. Um, and I, I do know that employers, uh, many of them, um, do try to do a good job to make certain that uh, what's being represented to them by their employees is accurate. I don't know that our government can do the type of job they can. 
Um, this amendment would be the uh, A20 amendment, Madam Can Chair. Can we have that distributed to the committee and to the bill's author, please? And Senator Draskowski moves the A20 amendment. Uh, we want to make sure that Senator Mann has a copy of that, as well as the committee members. Senator Draskowski, so would you like to proceed and describe the amendment? I please? will. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, members, um, the amendment provides that uh, if an employer terminates an employee for obtaining benefits through misrepresentation, uh, that they won't be held liable for a wrongful termination. So it allows the employer to terminate people without recourse by this government or by the employee if they're terminated for cheating the system. That's what the amendment does. I'd encourage your support. Thank you, Senator Draskowski. And as this is apparently the first time Senator Mann has seen this amendment, I just want to give uh, her the moment uh, to review and consult. Senator Mann. Madam Chair, thank you, Senator. So um, while I appreciate the intent here, my only concern is that sometimes misrepresentation can come out of mistakes. And we have seen that happen in all of our systems where someone fills out a form incorrectly. Um, and because of that, if there was stronger language about misrepresentation that was not, that was intentional, um, I think that would be different. But I do not want to penalize people and have them fired because they filled out a form wrong. And so because of that, I would recommend a no vote on this amendment. Senator Lang. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I guess before I take an opinion on Senator Draskowski's amendment, I think the, the question needs to be answered as far as misrepresentation. How would, in your bill, how would you find someone, uh, I guess, guilty or possibly guilty or accused of misrepresentation? And you talked about a strong uh, penalty system. How does that go? Or how is your intent as the author, how does that go? Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. So my intent as the author is, again, if people are um, fraudulently and intentionally cheating the system, that is one thing, right? But I, again, I do not want to penalize people for making paperwork mistakes, which, again, we see happen quite frequently. Um, and so that is my intent. Senator Lang. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I, I guess the question still remains, what's the mechanism for that in the bill? I, I, and you, 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 know, you mentioned that before, and whether or not I agree with this amendment or not, I think that's important to describe whether it works with the amendment, is if you're penalizing system within the bill that it, how it exists now, or at least what your intent is. I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you find someone that uh, possibly has some misrepresentation before you? Uh, protect them from any, any any additional fines or fees or whatnot. Ms. Fitzpatrick. Uh, Senator Lang um, and uh, Senator Draskowski mentioned um, employers sometimes have information. They are notified when an, a worker is uh, receiving benefits from this program. All current employers are sent a notification that their employee has applied for benefits and been approved for the period of time for which they've been approved. So there may be a situation where um, an employer could bring forward some information. There is um, obviously a variety of kinds of, um, again, this probably be part of the ad administrative implementation and rulemaking around the kinds of spot checks and other kinds of things that they do in these systems. I know there's computer algorithms that can be run to, you know, check for uh, patterns and things like that that, you know, detect um, certain types of um, activity that may, you know, be fraudulent. Um, so, again, it's not necessarily my area of expertise, but again, I think, again, we would be building on those kinds of uh, mechanisms that other states have used to, uh, you know, to make sure that um, we're doing our due diligence um, and, uh, in, you know, adequately making sure that that's not showing up in the system. Senator Morrison. Th thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess 
<laughs> Senator Lang. I'll be a little more specific on this one. Uh, and, and I'll change the names to protect the innocent. But let's say that uh, somebody uh, requests leave on, uh, uh, via this bill and the Facebook post comes up and that Facebook post shows that person on the beach. What is the mechanism in this bill that, uh, well, I guess, re realistically, I guess this question is for the author. What, what is the intent? How do, what is the mechanism to say, I, my, myself as an employer sees this, uh, what are the steps we go through? Be, and this is, I'm sorry, it's, that's a question that almost has to be asked before we vote on this amendment. Ms. Uh, Fitzpatrick. Senator Lang, there are um, opportunities for uh, the employer and the commissioner to uh, revisit an approval of a, a benefit account um, if those sorts of things were brought forward. Um, and there are, um, you know, opportunities. The, the department has a variety of opportunities to do subpoenas, to collect information that would be necessary to investigate uh, those kinds of circumstances if they're brought forward to the department. Um, and again, as my understanding, a lot of those are similar to, you know, a similar kind of complaint might come forward in the UI system. Uh, again, we tried to, again, to our to the all extent possible to build on uh, these, uh, you know, business processes that we already have in place. Um, and so, you know, there are a variety of mechanisms at the disposal of the commissioner um, to reinvestigate and reopen a, a benefit claim and a, mm -hmm. and a, a uh, an approval for benefits if information is brought forward, but perhaps the department could speak to that a little bit more. Senator Lang. I, I, okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Mann and, and uh, Mr. Fitzpatrick, so at this point in time, does the department has an investigative wing? Senator Mann. Madam Chair. So right now the department has uh, the commissioner as well as the judges have the capability of auditing, examining um, any books, correspondence, papers, records, this is all in the bill. Um, and they also have the authority to administer oath affirmations, take depositions, certify official acts, and it goes on um, in, in response to that question. So they have the ability to do that now, if I'm not. Thanks, Senator Lang. Uh, Commissioner Grove, did you want to add anything, or shall we move forward Madam with sure. questions? Yeah, just, just a clarifying question, just to uh, clarify between what doesn't exist and what would exist. Um, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Lang, the program doesn't exist yet, so no, we don't have today an appeals department that would look over this. We have one for UI, so we have good expertise in the building of how to do such a thing. Um, but after the passage of the bill and the building of the program, we would create such a unit that would do exactly that. Thank you, Commissioner Grove. Uh, I have uh, Senator Morrison, Senator Jasinski, and Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I just want to point out that I think this is actually directed at the, the, people don't just walk up and say, I'm going to take 12 weeks of paid leave. They need to have medical documentation. So it strikes me that this is directed at the physician who's filling out this form who would be committing fraud if, if it were not true. And physicians take that pretty seriously, so there is that layer of protection. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, this one doesn't apply to this amendment, but after this amendment, I would have a question. Thank All you. All right, we'll put you in the queue. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. To uh, satisfy the author's uh, uh, apprehension about uh, somebody filling out a form wrong, I was wondering if I could make an oral amendment to add the word intentional between through and misrepresentation on line 1.4. Senator Barr offers an oral amendment to the A20 amendment, adding the word intentional between the words through and misrepresentation. I'm wondering if council could read that amendment for us, please. Madam Chair and members, uh, Senator Barr moves to amend the A20 amendment on page one, line four, after through, insert intentional. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think that that is uh, a good thing. <laughs> Uh, and I accept the amendment to the amendment. 
Thank you, Senator Mann. Uh, we have before us an oral amendment offered by Senator Barr to the A20 amendment. Are there any questions to the oral amendment? Seeing no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And those say no. The amendment to the amendment is adopted. Before us, we have the A20 amendment that has now been amended. Madam. Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I think I'm reading this amendment. Maybe I understand the bill too much um, for this amendment to make sense. So I think the I think I think the uh, assertion here is that people might try to obtain benefits, uh, misrepresent their situation, get benefits, and then their employer finds out, and then their employer fires them, um, and we don't want them to be sued for wrongful termination, and. Uh, and that like the, the employer has lost out on this thing. Um, through this program, employees and employers pay in. It is an employee's benefit. They submit documentation to the department to receive that benefit. And so the time that they're gone, their wages are replaced from the department, not their employer, because that has already happened little by little, each paycheck. Uh, now if an employer find out, finds out that the you know, time that that person took off was for not what they said it was for, um, certainly they could terminate them for that. There's nothing in this bill that says that they can't do that um, at all. However, not every employer is going to know the reason why a person might be taking leave. That is still information that is personal. If it is safety leave, for example, for a really serious case of stalking or domestic violence, domestic assault, they might just know that somebody has applied for leave and is taking that leave. Um, and so I don't think that employers are in danger of being subject to civil action for wrongful termination for terminating employees for taking leave that they don't need. But the department is the one that is distributing the benefit. And so they are the ones who are going to be in charge of going after folks who misrepresent themselves, not their employers. Like that's really not the, for the benefits piece, for the money. So I would encourage a no vote because this is just doesn't really make sense. I get what you're trying to do, but it doesn't make sense. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Senator McQuaid, um, what the amendment does is says that the employer can't be sued for, for wrongful termination when they in turn, when they intentional or when they terminate somebody for intentional representation of this, so I think um, Senator Lang or somebody started to. I mean, I've known people who have been on disability insurance for because of a physical disability, who were found the next day re-roofing a building. Now, that's people do stuff, and. We saw that with Feeding Our Future, didn't we? And as, if we're contemplating a $1.7 billion bill here and a brand new tax placed on Minnesota employers and the majority wants to do this, we can't have more reckless legislating. We got to start to build in some protections for the employers, the employees themselves, and the taxpayers. And so that's what this amendment does. Um, you know, Uncle Charlie could actually live in New Hampshire and uh, the employee could end up spending the seven days in Florida. Thank you, Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Senator Dreskowski. And uh, I will remind us that uh, we have our points of view um, I would not say a bill that has gone through multiple hearings and will be through multiple hearings before it ever gets to the chamber for a full floor debate is reckless legislating. Um, I think we are being deliberate and thorough. It's important to me. Uh, and we have your amendment before us and we're going to hear from Senator Mann. Uh, but I also think it's important as you are zeroing in on concerns about someone cheating. Uh, that we're also hearing a lot of testimony and people coming and talking about why this proposal before us would be a benefit to them, and to their families, and to their well-being. Um, and I don't want to lose that either. Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and to uh, Senator Draskowski's uh, amendment, as well as the overall um, issue at, at hand, it's very clear in the legislation about the penalties, retaliation that the business may incur 
uh, or if, if retaliation occurred and the consequences for that. And with Senator May Quaid, you know, think about the description of how this will work. We just said, well, the employer's never going to know. And so compare that to, to the private sector, which many of us have worked in the, in the large corporations that provide that. They know. And they have the ability to manage the utilization. And if abuse occurs, they're the first there to know. So now we're going to have some uh, unnamed bureaucracy um, not even inform the, 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 the employer why somebody would leave or why they're gone for an extended period of time. And the appeal process and the entire uh, element of having them gone and having no control and then having very clear punitive damages or punitive actions for if they act in an inappropriate, inappropriate manner. And so I think we need some protections for businesses and a very clear definition. I think this is a process where we vet these ideas at this level. Uh, how does that work? Because when you're removing that from the employer's hands, and by the way, every one of them that are leaving are revenue generating resources, right? Vital resources in, across every one of the entities we have. I think we're just seeking comfort that businesses actually have a seat at the table, and, and from the description, they don't. And Senator Doskowski's amendment is pretty clear, very simple, very minor relative to the rest of the punitive damages that they'll, they'll incur. Um, it seems very reasonable to say, hey, at least in the intentional side when they get to it, how do you protect the businesses even a little bit? So I, I'm in, for, in favor of the amendment. Thank you. Senator Coran and members, I, I just want to draw our attention to this is a, a policy that is going to make its way through multiple committees. Uh, it is going to go to the Commerce Committee where I am sure you're going to be able to navigate, discuss, explore, examine uh, this proposal and its relationship with business. It's also going to the Judiciary Committee um, where I think there will be another opportunity uh, to talk about the issues of, uh, of uh, justice and fraud, if we're concerned about fraud. Um, this committee's jurisdiction um, in part is about rulemaking in this bill, but also about the fact that, you know, the state is an employer. Um, and as I understand and have listened to the testimony, I do believe employers have options um, in addition to potentially firing an employee, and that would be reporting to the Department of uh, Deed. Um, and so I, I understand this amendment is before us, um, and we should t take action on the amendment because we only have about 15 minutes left in this committee hearing, uh, and we have some work to go on another bill, so we're going to be coming back this evening. Uh, but we are spending a lot of time on hypotheticals, and you know it is our job to explore this, but some of these hypotheticals don't have much to do with the jurisdiction of this committee. Um, and I, I want to rein us in just a little bit to make sure that we're giving this bill a fair hearing. Uh, but we're not so far afield that we are uh, getting lost in the hypotheticals and not doing our job right here. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just one thing about what Senator Cran said, that businesses were not at the table or not being represented, and that's just a gross misrepresentation of how this bill was written um, because businesses were absolutely at the table. So I just want to throw that out there. Having said that, um, I think that if you have an employer who intentionally misrepresents themselves and takes time off, I think that is a breach of trust between employee and employer. Um, and if the employer wants to take action against that, I think it's their right to do so. Um, and so I, I'm fine with this amendment. Thank you, Senator Mann. Are there further questions? Before us, we have the A20 amendment that has been amended. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. And those opposed, say no. And the amendment is adopted. Are there other amendments uh, coming before this committee? Uh, Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer the A20. We just oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. <laughs> Too many okay. papers on this. How about the A19? Let's try that number. And can we get that distributed, please, uh, to the committee members uh, and to the bill author? Uh, and I'd also like to offer an oral amendment to that after well, it's distributed. Thank you. Let's let's get it distributed in before us. Uh, if you can explain the amendment and then offer your oral amendment. 
And again, thank you, uh, everybody, for your patience as uh, Senator Mann, I believe, is seeing this amendment for the first time. Um, Senator Barr, would you like to explain your amendment first? Um, okay. Madam, yes, Madam Chair, the, uh, the A-19 amendment removes a lot of the list of um, family members. It, 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 it deals specifically with family members and the definition of family members. And uh, I need to add a couple in on the oral amendment, if I could, whenever you think that's appropriate. Uh, thank you, Senator Barr. Um, if you would like to offer your oral amendment, so we have the amendment in the order uh, that we need it before the committee. Thank you. I'd like to add in, so we have... Uh, Line 1.2, it defines family member as a son or daughter, spouse, and then two point or 1.3 is or parent. And after, uh, after that comma, I'd like to add grandparents of either uh, uh, grandparents or spouses, grandparents, and legal guardian. Senator Barr, can you repeat that, please? Yes, Madam Chair. So it, line 1.3 would read, or parent, comma, grandparents, comma, spouse's grandparents, comma, and legal guardian. Thank you. And council, if you could read uh, for us uh, that oral amendment Madam Chair and members, um, I'd like to start with a question for Senator Barr about the uh, legal guardian. Um, I'm wondering if, if it means a person for whom the person has legal guardianship, as opposed to being able to take care of a legal guardian. Um, what my intent is, if... if um, the legal guardian of another person, if that other person is the one that's sick, and I'm the legal guardian of them. Does that clarify that? Thank you. Madam Chair and members, um, I'll suggest another way to say this. There might be, there might be something better, but I'll, I'll take a stab at this. The amendment uh, Senator Barr proposes is on page one, line three, delete or, after uh, the first comma, insert grandparents, comma, spouses, grandparent, comma, or the subject of legal guardianship. Comma, or um, no, no, no comma there. Yes, a comma there. <laughs> Uh, Council, could you read that for us one more time? Madam Chair and members, the amendment would be on page one, line three, delete, or, and after the first comma, insert grandparent, comma, spouse's grandparent, comma, or a subject of legal guardianship, comma. And Senator Barr incorporates this language into his amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair, yes. Uh, I want to make sure before we begin debating the amendment, does anybody have any question about the change in the amendment before us? Okay. Senator Lang. Maybe, Madam Chair, maybe just a little clarification on what, uh, sorry, uh, Medical Leave Act of 1993 entails. I know that that's a big question. <laughs> when, it, when it comes to the definition, I, I think that's maybe something where the department could give us a... Senator Barr, do you have do you have anything you want to share about that? I don't have a clue, Madam Chair. <laughs> Just being honest with you, I didn't didn't write it and didn't read the uh, Medical Act of 1993. But there's definitions in there for son, daughter, spouse, things like that. Council, do you want to just give us your general understanding of uh, the, the answer to this question? 
Madam Chair and members, as I understand FMLA, um, the, it is an opportunity for um, eligible people to take unpaid leave for specified conditions. And, and Council uh, James, if you could, for us, um, put into plain meaning what this amendment is doing uh, within the context of this bill. Madam Chair and members, this is uh, changing the application um, of, the, of the provisions um, so that it constrains or, or changes um, the, the, the people who uh, an employee is allowed to take care of um, and, have, and be eligible for paid leave. All right. Senator Mann. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so first, I would uh, be cautious about us accepting amendments that we don't fully understand. But most importantly, um, we wanted our definition of caregivers to be very inclusive because we know that in rural communities, this is a problem. In rural communities, uh, we more often will care for a non-family member due to distance and other factors. I've worked in a rural hospital my entire life and I see in the ER on a daily basis, someone coming in with their neighbor, someone coming in with their nieces or nephews, uh, and those will be the people who will take care of them when they go home with their broken hip or their broken arm. Um, and most importantly, we need to acknowledge that extended kin networks are more common in, Minnesotans, uh, in Minnesota's immigrant communities, in our indigenous communities, in our LGBTQ communities, um, and our communities of color. And so in order to address the health and economic disparities that we see in those communities and we see in the state of Minnesota, uh, who are also, by the way, all paying into the program, uh, we need to make sure that their family structures uh, are included and respected. And so respectfully, uh, Senator Barr, I would request a no vote on that amendment. Thank you, Senator Mann. Uh, Senator Lang. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I get, okay, sorry, it spurred on another question. Um, I, I did have some questions when it came to, uh, on, on page 11, the whole section 11, when it came to what a family member is, and um, particularly uh, paragraph 6. And that's the one, that if I'm going to support this amendment, um, and if 19 Medical Leave Act of 1993 uh, specifies on who a family member is in, a, in a, you know, a satisfactory method in a satisfactory way, I think maybe that's a, a better way to go. But you know, the, the thought process happens when uh, paragraph 6 says, any individual who is related by blood or affinity and whose association with the applicant is equivalent of a family relationship you know, I, I guess when it comes to blood, I, ha I have a, a cousin, Ted, who I, I call him my cousin, but I think that's probably a little bit of a lie because he's my cousin like three times removed and uh, second nature. He's got a half-brother who is married that I've never met in my life, but we're related by blood. And you can see how this, this paragraph all of a sudden becomes very complicated. And um, I, I, I guess the question is, what, at what point, where's the limit? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, so in that case, um, Senator Lang, you know, if you're, I don't know if you said it was your cousin. That's what I keep calling him. So your so-called cousin, if he <laughs> becomes ill and he wants you to take care of him, wow. I mean, what an honor for you to take care of someone you don't <laughs> hang out with that much, right? So that doctor's always have to come to you. And it would be weird, I think, in that particular case for him to choose you because of what you just explained. We have an extended family network. <laughs> So my point is, when someone is ill, right, I'm just going through chemotherapy, I'm vomiting my brains out day in and day out, I'm not going to call my cousin three times removed to come take care of me. And so we're going to have to draw the line at people uh, taking care of each other in an honest and thoughtful way. Senator Barr. Thank you, Madam Chair. So that's basically what I'm trying to get at at the amendment. The Family Medical Leave Act is what this basically expands, or so that's why I use that definition. Um, but I would like to work with you some more on this because this is where the fraud can come in really easily. Nobody, when you get to a, a family relationship or affinity, the equivalent thereof, how do you prove that to anybody? 
there is no way to prove that, so I would like to work with you on that. I mean, there's multiple committee stops. If we could just clean this language up around, you know, Cousin Ted is down there in Florida, and, you know, Cousin Ted and I, we're like this, except we've only met once in our life. There's, right. you know, they may be blood. There's no way to actually prove the, the, the closeness or the affinity. So um, let's kick some ideas around for before next mo uh, future committee stops, if you would. Uh, does that mean you're withdrawing your amendment? Uh, no, I want to vote on it anyway. It'll probably fail, but I want to vote on it anyway. All right. Thanks. So we have a couple more people who have comments. Uh, Senator McQuaid, Senator Morrison, Senator McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So members, I really want to just reground this in, in two things. One, every person gets 12 weeks of family leave. They don't get 12 weeks of family leave per person listed in this section. They just get 12 weeks of family leave no matter what family member they take it for, whether it's your aunt, your cousin three times removed, your dearest best friend who lives next door to you. I want to remind us all that we actually just went through a pandemic where weird people bubbled together. And we saw different kinds of family groups formed because of proximity and childcare and kids who are the same age or workplaces or what have you. And so I want to remind us all that it's just 12 weeks for whomever you take it for. And additionally, because the family leave requires documentation, it's somebody that has to know you well enough to take you to a doctor's appointment to give you the doctor's certification that they need you to provide them care for up to 12 weeks. So the inclusive family definition, as Senator Mann so, said so well, is meant to acknowledge that there's a bunch of different ways that we have our loved ones in our lives, whether you know, I have a, an aunt and an uncle who aren't married that have been together for 30 years. If we did it by your definition, Senator Barr, they actually wouldn't qualify to care for each other, right? But they are married and have children. They just aren't, or sorry, they're not married, but they've been partnered for 30 years and they've got children together. So we just, we can trust that Minnesotans uh, will take the 12 weeks for whomever they need to take it for, whether it's the little old lady that goes to your church that you love dearly, your best friend who's a senator who's barking her brains out and you want to help her, or your spouse or whoever. Um, the documentation serves as that, you know, substantiation that you have a relationship and the 12 weeks are just the 12 weeks for whomever and it helps alleviate that burden on our system inpatient hospice short-term hospice all of those things so i urge a no vote on this because the inclusive family definition is important right, got senator morrison we have senator carlson and i would like to take a vote on this amendment before we uh, recess senator morrison thank you madam chair and i just uh, senator may quaid basically made my point but i just wanted to go back to the seven day medical event requiring documentation from a healthcare provider. Thank you, and Senator Carlson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess I'm, I don't know if I missed something with, with the amendment, but the amendment says uh, page 11 deletes line 2223, and that includes a sibling or a sibling spouse and connections to a sibling. And uh, it would not have a problem with me if I knew what the federal Family and Medical Leave Act of 1993 says about siblings. Uh, I just had a sister that passed away two months ago. So, and we did have to take care of her. Very, it was a very serious issue with her. So I want to make sure, and, I, and by the way, my wife has had a, a brother that passed away. You know, the, all of these are unmarried. I have two more sisters that are unmarried. So the end of the family is me and my wife. So I want to make sure that this, uh, and I don't need family uh, leave because uh, obviously I'm retired and work here. So, uh, um, but I do want to make sure that people in that same situation are still uh, accommodated. Thank you, Senator Carlson. Madam Chair. Senator Mann. Brief uh, comment. Uh, as far as I know, siblings are not included in FNLA. Thank you, Senator Mann. Madam Seeing Chair. Senator Barr. In the interest of giving the committee um, the, the fairest explanation, could we table this to the evening and I'll come back with a definition for family medical leave, FMLA, and then either we can withdraw it at that time or vote on it. Senator Barr, if you would like to do some research between now and when we come back at 5.30, that is uh, perfectly acceptable to me and, and I think we'll just table it then. wise. So we're going to lay uh, uh, Amendment A19 on the table. We're going to lay Senate File 2 on the table. This committee is in recess until 5.30. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.